I, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna say, I bet that everybody here has at least one time in your life learned something from looking at a graph. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that was kind of an easy one. But yeah, because that's, that's what we do, isn't it? That's at least what we've done since the, the end of the 1700s uh, when William Playfair gave us our line bar area pie charts. And we learn about these in grammar school. They're an established part of our vocabulary, our culture and our vocabulary. Uh, so um, that said, tonight's theme, of course, is the ocean. So I thought I would show you a graph of some marine-related phenomena. I have some graphs describing the tidal activity of the San Francisco Bay from a few years back. So here is um, two days worth of tide levels. And you can see, of course, how the, the, the tide went up and down. Um, unless, of course, you can't see it, either because of blindness or because of a visual impairment. So in that case, if I wanted to communicate this to you, what I could do is I could take each of these data points and I could feed them to a software synthesis program, like one called Super Collider that I like, and it would play this as a melody. I came up with something, a water type sound. Um, there we go. No, 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 come on, come on. Ah. Well, let's see, where are my water sounds? City forest. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Oh. Mm. Boy, we had this working before in, this, in the uh, sound check. And, and uh, OK, so if I go back like this, and then I do this, there we go. So we can hear the contours of this. And I should point out that the playback time of these two days is completely arbitrary. It can be whatever I want. And so can the pitch range of these curves. OK. Uh, so by the way, when you download information about the tide levels, you get other data sets too, like this one about the water temperature. So here's another sound for that. It's meant to sound a little bit warmer. So the pulsing right there and the brightness of the sound reflects the water temperature. So that uh, faster pulsing and brighter sound means a, a higher temperature. You also get information about the wind. Filtered noise is a great way to synthesize wind sound. So the pitch of this reflects the wind speed. The amplitude envelope of each of these grains of noise reflects the gust. The pointedness or the dullness of the sound reflects the gust level. And the direction is mapped to the stereo panning position. And then you also get information about the air. So here's another airy sound. And the pitch of this reflects the temperature. And the air pressure is reflected in the filter bandwidth, the whistliness or airiness of the sound. So if you put all of these together and you play them at once, you get this composite oral picture of the tidal activity. And we call this sonification, representing data with sound. I like to think of it as the music of science. Uh, it's a lot like visualization, really, except that instead of mapping information to visual symbols, we map it to auditory symbols. OK, so I'm, I'm clearly kind of enthusiastic about this. Uh, but you know, so what? Why, why should anybody else care about this particularly, just because I like it? In fact, somebody recently tossed this straw man at me and said, what, science and music? What do those have to do with each other? Isn't that like combining mathematics and pottery or something? 
And I said, well, uh, you know, I can see how you could use pottery skills to represent mathematical functions, you know, for one thing. Uh, but for another, it's not like this is my idea. I mean, th the idea of representing information with sound is kind of an old idea, actually. I mean, anybody ever hear of the Geiger counter, for example? Or maybe the sonar. And when I say sonar, there's always somebody who's going to go, oh, yeah, like in the hunt for Red October, that scene where they hear the submarines. So, yeah. The, this, is, this is an old idea. Um, the word sonification came about in the early 1990s with the establishment of the International Community for Auditory Display, or ICAD. And they wrote this nice summary for the NSF in 1999. Um, turns out there are reasons that we evolved to have both eyes and ears. They don't give us completely redundant information about our environment. They, they do different things for us. So uh, as far as the eyes go, as far as visualization, well, there's this well-established vocabulary that I talked about before. Uh, and there's also the fact that it was the only kind of informatics that we could publish along with text until fairly recently. Um, besides this, a visualization is synoptic. We can see the whole thing at once, like we did before with these graphs that we saw, uh, that, that Aaron showed us. Uh, and in general, what the eyes are good for are giving us static information, things like size or shape or texture or color. We tend to rely on those. What about the ears? What do they give us? Well, f for one thing, of course, uh, we can hear from 360 degrees around us, unlike the eyes, which have to be pointed at something for us to sense it. Uh, but more interestingly, the real um, strength of the ears is not in static phenomena, but dynamic phenomena, changes in rhythm or pitch or spectrum over time. The ear is an excellent pattern recognizer for changing phenomena. The ear is also superior to the eyes, it's been shown for following multiple streams of information. This is, this is how we can follow counterpoint in, in chamber music. Uh, speaking of music, there's also this extremely affective quality that sound has that we don't get from visuals alone. Uh, just think of how when you hear your favorite song from high school, it's like you go back in time. There's this box of emotional associations and memories that suddenly become very palpable. Or just think of how flat a, a movie is without the soundtrack. And so sound has this particular embrace to it. And so the, the people at ICAD started asking, well, given this information age and the risk of information overload, Mightn't it make sense to represent information with sound as well as visuals? And there's evidence that this is actually a, a pretty good idea. Here's a, here's a real good example. There's an astronomer named Wanda Diaz-Merced. Uh, she was rendered blind by an illness. And she worked to develop this program called Exonify that allows her to listen to graphs. And in her TED talk, she describes quite compellingly how this enables her to work at the same level of research that she was working at when she was sighted. And what's more, she was able to detect the presence of certain electromagnetic resonances by listening to these data sets that nobody had detected by visual inspection. And so a lot of her sighted colleagues find that they like to use it because they can often hear patterns that they have trouble seeing. So what we have here in support of sonification, we have an example of a software program that was created for purposes of accessibility but it had this nice side effect of leading to a new discovery. And I like to think of these as two legs of a three-legged stool supporting sonification. The third leg being, of course, engagement, that effective quality that I, that I described earlier. What preoccupies me lately is the idea that if students are introduced to scientific concepts in a multimodal 
musical way, they will likely have a more holistic and intuitive understanding of the material than they're going to get with visuals alone. And I often think, what if we were to raise a generation of students to regard science as not something that you just look at, but also something that you listen to? And what effect would that have on our research climate 20, 30 years down the line? So let's say we did that, and we said we're going to start doing this all the time. How do you do that? How do you represent data sets with sound? Well, the first way a lot of people think of, oh, it must be this, is a, a literal approach. It's sometimes called audification. You just treat a bunch of data points as audio samples, and you play them like an audio file. This has been used by a number of seismologists, for example, which kind of makes sense because you know a seismic wave is like an acoustic wave traveling through the Earth. Um, here are three audifications of the earthquake that shut down the Washington Monument a few years ago, and they're measured from different observatories. You can see that they look pretty different. Um, from Albuquerque, and then from Alaska, we got this. There's a seismologist named Chris Hayward who's described being able to differentiate between seismic events and atomic explosions by doing this. And this, of course, has important implications for nuclear weapons verification work. Um, this is a good approach if you have tens of thousands of data points and they're describing a wave of, of some kind. Um, you do lose a little bit of detail. You got to play tens of thousands of them per second. So it's kind of like zooming way, way out on a photograph. It's also hard to represent multi-dimensional data this way. So another way of doing it that gives you a little bit more flexibility is what I was showing you before, is sonification. It's, it's, it's symbolic. You, design an instrument that plays the data set like a player piano roll or like a, a musical score. Here's a sonification of that same earthquake. And this plays back over the same amount of time that the earthquake took place over. And you know, to me, this sounds shakier than those audifications did. Um, and at this point, sometimes people raise their hands and say, well, yeah, but wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you design a sound that plays this? So we're not really listening to the sound of the earthquake, are we? This is like this layer of artifice between the perception and, and the information. And I say, well, you know, it's kind of like when you're choosing views on MapQuest. You know, if I want to show you where I live, that's where my house is. And this shows you that I live in a foresty area. I do not live at an ice cap. I do not live at the beach. So that's nice. But what if you wanted to drive there? You would probably choose the symbolic street view. And I wouldn't say that that has less integrity than the literal satellite view. It's a question of what is the right tool for the job at hand. And then sometimes people say, yeah, OK, but all right. But if you're, if you're taking these data points and you're mapping them to things like pitches, you got to do multiplications and transformations and things like this, right? I'm not going to know what those values are by listening to it, am I? Uh, and I say, uh, this is correct. You, you, you will not. If, if what you need are the exact values, this is probably not the right tool for the job. However, if what you need to know is the behavior over time of something, well, sonification may well be the right tool for the job, given our sensitivity to pattern recognition that I described. So speaking of integrity, um, a few years back, I got to create a whole slew of sonifications of cosmological phenomena for a short film created by Nobel laureate George Smoot and Grateful Dead drummer Mickey Hart. And they showed it not too far from here. Um, and in the discussion afterwards, George raised some interesting points. He said, you know, when we, when we look at these uh, space pictures that NASA puts out, they're not exactly literal. They clean them up. 
They often colorize them so that we can see multiple electromagnetic bands that are outside of the visible light spectrum. Furthermore, he said, when we represent information, no matter how complex it is, the history of the universe, uh, the structure of a DNA molecule, it's usually on something that's about yay big, about the size of a newspaper. This is about what we can take in. So symbolizing and transposition are just part and parcel of informatics. These are not renegade side effects of sonification or auditory display. That's just what you do. So that, that was a pretty nice thing to be involved in. That opened some doors for me. I've worked on a number of really interesting projects with top scientists. It's been a great uh, learning experience for me. It's made Penn State a place where sonification happens, which is nice. What I've come to realize I am lacking is assessment data that backs up the enthusiasm that I and some of these scientists have for this. And so, Looping back to the theme of this evening, I'm hoping that I can get some of that assessment data by work with ocean scientists. So I, I attended NACFI in November, and I met a number of people who are interested in collaborating. I mean, Heather here, chiefly among them. And what we're hoping to do is initiate some large-scale projects that demonstrably engage and educate people and sensitize them to responsible stewardship of our oceans. And doing this, I think, would not only be a great step for the field of auditory display, but it could also be pretty good for the health of our planet. Um, so I hope some of you find this as interesting as I do. If you do, perhaps you'd like to consider coming to the auditory display conference this summer, which will be held at Penn State. Uh, I'm chairing it so I can tell you everything you'd like to know about it, or you can just go to that website. Um, so like I said, it, it really is my great privilege to be here um, tonight. These, these talks that we're giving are meant to be brief conversation starters. There's a lot more I could talk about, and so I hope to continue conversing with many of you later this evening. Thanks very much. <laughs>